And I'm chairing the Committee on Study on Market Skills, driving it down from vocational colleges into the high school level. We had a real good first meeting. We had some outside speakers that came in. And uh, I think we got a lot of people excited about this. Uh, I'm going to give you some statistics that you might find interesting. Here in Georgia, high school's dropouts cost Georgia approximately $14 billion in lost wages, taxes, and productivity over their lifetime. That's based upon more than 56,000 students that did not, did not graduate from Georgia high school. We talk a lot about teachers and turnover. When the Georgia school year began this fall, more than 15,000 of the teachers would not be returning to schools in which they taught last year. The estimated cost on that, $185 million. We were recently given some statistics where our ninth graders, we had graduation rate of about 69 percent, and it's hovered between 60 and 70 percent for many, many years through all kinds of administrations. And uh, it's something that I think at this point in time, we need to get really involved. And one of the things we try to do was get people here that have thought outside the box and been very, very successful. I think uh, we were blessed that uh, I got to hear one of these speakers already, so I know he's good, and I've spoken to the other people. And each of these, what they've done in common, they've increased academic rigor and yet combined some technical elements of education. The Dalton School, Dalton High School, where Debbie Freeman principal, they've got a pre-engineering curriculum that I'm sure she's going to talk about today. Uh, Grady, Dr. Vincent Murray, is organized around small learning communities. Camden's a little bit more traditional in what they're doing in the vocational ed, but they're all a much tougher academic core. The bottom line is this, all three of these school systems have demonstrated improvement on achievement. So at this point in time, I'd like, Debbie, if you want to come up. Thank you, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you today about some of the good things that have been going on at Dalton High School for the last few years. I have brought with me, this is for those of you, none of you know, but this is my first year as principal. And so when I got the phone call from uh, Dr. Bottoms, I quickly picked up the phone and called my predecessor, Mr. Philip Brown. So I brought him with me today, <laughs> and he's going to help me as we talk about the kinds of things that we've been doing at Dalton for the last few years. We currently have about 1,600 students in our building. We have a Hispanic population of about 54%. Um, of those 54%, we have about 165 kids who are currently being served in our ELL program. Those are students who are struggling with learning the language. We have 56% of our students in our economically disadvantaged subgroup. And we have about 120 students who are being served for disabilities. These are our graduation rates for the last few years, and you can see that when we started focusing on graduation rate in 2002, we had a 56.5 percent, and we said, well, we've got to do something. So we started looking at the programs as they were and what we could do in-house to improve our statistics. This is our data on the graduation test for our first-time takers, and you can see the increases with most of them being in social studies and in science. I think that if you look across the uh, state, that that's the same trend that you'll see, that the lowest scores, again, are in social studies and in science. These are end of course test data that we have. I question the Algebra 1, and I ask you to question that with me because I do not think that's correct. But the rest of the data does look correct. We have um, focused really hard on getting very clear on our standards and what it is the kids need to know, understand, and be able to do. And those uh, results are starting to pay off.
This is the um, high schools that work assessment for our math mean scores, and you can see that we have improved 11 points from 2002 to 2006. I accidentally left out a couple of slides talking about reading and science. We have improved our reading scores over 16 points and our science scores over 20 points in our high schools that work assessments. Ms. Freeman brought me to talk to you guys because uh, I'm a product of Dalton High School out of the career and technical vocational programs at that time. And when I came back to work at Dalton, I was a drafting teacher, then became the uh, career tech coordinator. And that was about five or six years ago. And when we did that, we had two TNI programs, and then we had probably five smatterings of stuff. And so I took a look, look at what was going on out in the uh, community in Dalton. We tried to link our career tech to economic development for Dalton City with an idea of looking at the data that we were, we were putting out that, at that time. One of the programs that we put in was Project Lead the Way, which is a pre-engineering curriculum that I'm pretty uh, smitten with because as a former technology teacher, when I looked at what pre-engineering and what technolo technology education and how that's merging together across the nation, I realized that Project Lead the Way was something we needed to, to really look at. The neat thing about Project Lead the Way at Dalton High School is if you go into one of those classrooms, you're going to see a majority of females in that program. Very uncommon in a technology, industrial arts, TNI program to see a, a lot of females in there working with micrometers, doing working with robotics and milling machines. And so that's kind of a neat uh, occurrence that has happened through Project Lead the Way. Additionally, we offered, um, we grew seven programs in the last seven years. A lot of that and grants coming from uh, through the State Department for uh, lab renovations. And those lab renovations, if you look. We looked at the existing labs we had to offer. We looked at what industry certification was requiring, and we looked at what we already had resource-wise. We took some of the state resources that were given to us, a lot of local dollar, and we redid eight labs. The benefit of redoing eight labs is the good thing we did this, this time in this renovation was we looked at what curriculum, what the outcome we wanted for students. We did this because we started looking at the data, and as we were looking at the high schools at work, uh, key practices, we realized we could make a bigger impact for students in our community if we looked at the what we were asking students to know and be able to do in the career tech classes. So if you go to Dalton High School right now, uh, the bottom floor, and again, I graduated from Dalton High School many years ago, and the bottom floor doesn't look anything like it did at that time, because when you go in there now, you'll see very high-tech industries, um, lots of robotics and milling machines. And um, the exciting part of that for me is, is that I know that in my industry, heavy manufacturing, when you look at the uh, amount of automation that's occurring right now, where I know that I'm training folks who are going to be able to go out and uh, make a dent in Dalton City for, uh, for that manufacturing industry. So my two slabs, slides I'm going to talk about are the improved career tech programs with a high tech focus. And if you look at the bottom, where, if I go back one, I've, government services. <clears throat> a lot of our students, uh, Hispanic students, really had no idea how the local government worked. So instead of implementing a law enforcement program, what we did is we implemented a government services program. A component of that is law enforcement. We looked at all the things that people who are bilingual could impact our community with. So we have students who are now working for um, um, emergency medical services, a 911 call center, all those things that we would need bilingual students. Um, so a lot of my students can now work in those areas. If I limited it to just law enforcement, then I would have had an impact on my law enforcement, but there was other areas they could have impacted. And when we did that, we're seeing the side benefit is we have students now who know how our city operates uh, with regards to the services that are offered to its uh, citizens. We didn't have that five years ago, and that was one of the big benefits we looked at around. And the neat thing about that is the state gave us the leeway to do those kind of um, things as we fine-tune career tech programs for what our community needs. So 
So if we think back to around 2002 when Dalton started into this initiative with High Schools That Work and with Dr. Allie McGill as our superintendent and Philip as the principal and with me as the assistant principal, the first focus we did was the career tech area. Once we um, had that pretty much under control, then we started looking at what else was keeping our students from achieving at higher rates. The first thing that we did was we re eliminated the lower level classes. And we basically did that in one year by just saying level of lower level classes will no longer exist. We increased the number of co-teaching classes for our students with uh, learning disabilities and those type things. Another biggie that we did to get a lot of um, increase in student achievement is that we increased the number of kids who were uh, trying to be dual SEAL completers, graduate from high school with a career tech diploma and college prep diploma. We uh, last year had over 60% of our graduates graduating with dual SEALs. And this, uh, this year, out of our 1,600 kids, we have almost 1,200 of those taking career tech classes. And of those 1,200, we have about 1,700 classes being taught. So some of those kids are taking more than one. We revamped our ELL program because that is a big part of our school. We looked at what we were doing with that program that was keeping the kids from getting to the career tech classes. And we did a lot in removing gatekeepers, if you will, gatekeepers at um, the registration process, the advisement process, those type of things. What was it that was keeping our students from getting into classes they needed to be? Those academic rigorous classes and those career tech classes that would offer them more opportunities when they graduate. Remember I told you we just removed lower level classes so we learned very quickly that we were going to have to structure some extra help built into the day. So we revised the schedule, which will allow us uh, the opportunity for students to get that extra help during the school day, because many of our kids cannot come early, cannot stay late. We put in additional instruction classes in math and language arts. We put in graduation review classes, and this one is really important. The one year that we did this in a proactive measure, by giving predictor tests to our 10th graders. We got a much better graduation rate, but it takes a lot more faculty to do it in a proactive way. So we right now are currently uh, in the reactive mode and just offer the graduation review classes for those seniors who have not yet mastered the graduation test. The advisement program at Dalton High School is not as strong as it needs to be. We have um, started this several times, but now we're almost to the point where it's working for us. And what we have done is we have de developed an advisement program with teachers who are interested in being advisors and those teachers who understand reading transcripts and uh, what it takes to get the kids headed down the right way. We do have uh, individualized academic counseling prior to registration, and we do have parent night where parents can come and talk with the counselors about their, the courses their students are taking. With our staff development, of course, we became a high schools that work site, I believe it was about 2002. And we are, uh, our system is involved with the Center for Leadership and School Reform with Phil Sletke Center. Our district is doing quite a bit with Understanding by Design with um, Elizabeth Rosini and Everett Klein. We are doing system assessment work to raise the academic rigor for all of our classes with our students taking um, system assessments at grades three, five, eight, and 10. And we are striving to train all teachers to the highest level, because if we train all teachers to teach the highest level, then those techniques will be used in all classrooms. Debbie, what's, uh, what's IB? IB is International Baccalaureate Program. Okay. And we are doing quite a bit more of teachers teaching teachers. Prior to uh, 2002, we did not do much of that. But we are sending uh, teachers to get strategies, bring them back, and reteach to our faculty. 
we're, when we're looking at action steps as to what um, we can do to continue improving. I think it's important for us to note that the um, staff development, which, al which um, allows our career tech teachers to be taught how to incorporate math science in their career tech classes is very important. The staff development of new teachers coming into our school, aligning state career standards with national career standards. Increase opportunities for travel. All of the things that we have done at Dalton High School, nothing is, an ori is original. We stole it from all these places that we spent a lot of time traveling and getting good ideas and then bringing them back and tweaking them for our school. We do focus on the key practices uh, from high schools that work. And we do focus on quality and qu engaging students, uh, work for our students. The uniqueness of each school, I think, is where the uh, key indicator comes from. You can look at all these best practices and all the opportunities that you have, but you have to uh, take into consideration how it applies to your school. I thank you for the opportunity to come and share with you today. I've given you my phone number, my email, if you have any other questions, and certainly I'll be glad to talk with you. All right, Deb. What's your number, Ed? 84. I don't know. I, I think that's it. Yeah. I have a few questions for you, and I want you to understand that I'm not a professional educator, so, so that's okay. why some of the things that, that may come second nature to you are, are, are something new and interesting to me. Um, the first thing, the most dramatic thing you talked about was the proactive versus reactive uh, tutoring, I guess, for the, for the high school uh, equivalent high school exams. And I noted that in 2004, 2005, you had a jump in your graduation rate to 80.7, and then it slipped back to 72.6. Is that was was that what you were talking about? That's one of the indicators for that. Yes. Yes, ma'am. If you could explain to me what you mean by proactive versus reactive. Okay. What we did in that particular situation was um, the graduation test is administered for the first time at 11th grade. So we looked at our current 10th graders that year in the a year ahead of time and predicted if those kids would be successful their first time in taking the graduation test in the areas of social studies and science because those are the two areas that are most often failed. Sure. And the kids who did not score, um, did not show that they would pass the graduation test based on the predictor test, we put them in an additional instruction class, a graduation test review class and uh, worked with them prior to taking the test just on those skills that they needed to be successful. Okay, and that one move jumped your graduation rate possibly from that was, state average up to 80%. Up to that was a very important part of that. But the number of faculty to do that, okay. we, we did some other creative things in the schedule sure. at that point to allow that to happen. And now my next question, if I may, Mr. Chairman, this yes, is sir. real interesting to me. How much are we talking about in terms of the cost that you weren't able to sustain? In terms of cost, I probably would need, uh, for my school of 1600, I probably would have been able to continue that kind of practice. I know that some other schools are doing this too. Sure. Uh, Pepperell High School is doing this, if you want to remember that name. Um, I believe we could have done it with two additional social studies teachers and two additional science teachers for a school of 1,600 kids. And that would be, could you give me a ballpark as to, in terms of the cost? Four additional yeah. teachers. Around 200,000 possibly. Yeah, that'd be right. And I'm guessing on that figure, I do not know. Okay. And if I may, Ms. Jim, just a couple more questions. Just help me out here. Um, you talked about eliminating the lower level classes. What did you mean by that? Okay, at that point, um, we had classes for our sheltered ESOL students. We had applied classes for language arts and math. Mm -hmm. We had regular classes that we call referred to as CP classes, and we had advanced classes, and then we had AP or IB classes, and. What we realized when the, when the state 
was uh, implementing end of course tests. It did not matter what kind of algebra class you were in, you were going to take algebra one end of course test. And we uh, thought that we were not giving our students the best background to be successful there. So we looked at just eliminating all lower level classes. And currently we have our um, AP slash IB classes in our college prep. And we do have some sheltered classes for our EOL kids. Let me follow up with that a minute. How did you, how did you have to approach your faculty to, to get them <laughs> co committed to teaching all these, all these students, every one of them 100% to higher standards? I, I'd be real curious because they've had these people group. You're, in, you're you know, you get locked in in a group by the time they get to you. And I'm just wondering how you got through to your faculty members that we got to raise standards for everybody. And you can pass that question if you want. If you, you know, if you want. Well, I, you I'll come in and then I'll pass yes. to him. He's over there. He's over there chuckling. So I think well, I'm nervous. <laughs> we are chuckling because at that point. Um, <laughs> We did that when neither one of us had very much experience in school leadership, uh, but it somehow worked for us. We met with our department chairs, we shared with them the data that we had, and we told them the idea of what we wanted to do, knowing that we were going to increase the number of classes that have co-teachers. For those of you who do not have the educational background, that simply means that if you have a lot of uh, ELL students or ESS students in your classroom, there would be two adults in the classroom, two teachers working together. And we thought that they would not be willing to do that, but they were. We let them vote, and they were willing to do that, and we did that. But then that's when the rubber hit the road, if you will, in that uh, we started seeing an increase in our failure rate and had to look at that additional help. Okay. Now, Mr. Brown may have a very different take on that. <laughs> I'm laughing because we were both assistant principals at the time, and. Um, very naively, when we met with the department chairs, our plan was to develop, do this over two years. And we had worked for a long time developing a step-by-step -step process. And we showed them what we wanted to do. We showed what the data was. And we started off by asking, what is grade level work? And everybody said, well, that's easy. That's college prep work. And I said, well, why do we do anything else? So let's do at least grade level. So we started that with a conversation. And then what happened was we had um, a high failure rate because it was a little passive aggressiveness on the, I can say this now that I'm no longer the principal at Dalton High, but um, to protect her, what happened was a lot of our teachers didn't believe it would work. Now, additionally, we went to the school board at that same time, or about that same time, and we said we needed to make certain that we had a more flexible schedule and um, a flexible way, using the state standard as the minimum requirements for graduation at Dalton High School. Um, then we said we needed to be able to fine tune it. So we looked at all of that in three years down the road, and that's where we are right now. So when we did this, um, we were very naive, and we found out very quickly we've got to put a lot of support classes in. So it took a lot of time from the other adults in the building to make that happen. Good. Good. Thank you. Got it. Can I? I think one other thing that we need to mention about that before we move on is that we did have to increase our faculty size. Um, our students with disabilities, uh, at the beginning I said we had 120. That is our largest department faculty-wise. We have about 16 teachers who share those co-teaching responsibilities. Okay. Just one more question. Uh, well, one follow-up once again. I'm, I'm really am fascinated by a 10% jump because of of early interdiction. Um, $200,000 cost. Uh, what's, do you know, happen to know what this total school budget, um, school system budget is for, for Dalton? I'm sorry, I do not know that. Okay. Seems like a pretty, pretty good uh, remedy. Well, and there were some other variables. I'm not real sure yeah. on everything that happened there, but I do know that uh, Pepperell High School, who is do using the predictor test and doing a very good job at it, as a matter of fact, they require their students who do not, who they do not predict to be in pass plus area to uh, come during fall break or winter break and have extra tutoring time during the times when the other kids are on break, and that's working for them. The focus for us in our graduation test now is moving, um, increasing the number of pass plus students instead of those who just score in the pass area. That's our next challenge. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come appear before us today and 
based upon what I've heard so far today, I have no doubt in my mind that you're going to take Dalton High School to the next academic, academic level. Uh, but I have a question here. It's a very simple question. Uh, you made a comment about uh, proceeding to the next higher level and you assess those students. What were some of the factors that you identified that were prohibiting those students from proceeding to the next level? If, if you care to elaborate a little more on that. I think a lot of that uh, stems from, as um, someone Rick, uh, said earlier, by the time students get to high school, if they are already tracked, if you will, um, it's difficult for them to break ranks and be able to achieve at the higher levels. So I think for us as a school district that we need to be looking at what is it we're offering, and certainly we're doing this, what is it we're offering academically to all kids in the earlier grades, and what kind of structures do, do those students need to be able to be successful with a high socioeconomic dis group, economically disadvantaged group, uh, there's many structures that the school needs to put in place that the parents just do not understand the students need. For example, that extra time built in the day for them to get extra help in difficult areas, hard to learn areas. And um, I think that our middle school and our elementary school schools are working to address those. Additionally, one thing that's keeping our students from achieving to the highest level, I believe, is the transient rate. We have a lot of uh, students who've moved back and forth in and out during a school year. To your predecessor, um, during your presentation, you mentioned governmental or government services and teaching the Hispanic population. As reading an article in today, this country is about to embark upon a historic uh, number 300 million uh, population here, and that person has predicted to be of Hispanic origin. Uh, was that a collaborative effort on behalf of uh, your school, the local municipalities and the uh, county governments in that area? Did you have the mayors and councils come in to speak to these individuals? How do you go about achieving that? Good question. Um, no, sir. I'm pretty stupid when it comes to implementing things. So what I did was I had a school resource officer who had a unique knack with students. When I went to the school resource officer, at the same time I had been talking, uh, we do a lot of conversation with students, home visits, a lot of things like that, and I kept realizing that there was a disconnect between my uh, Latino culture and my American culture, and I said there's got to be some reason for this. Um, those aren't the only vi home visits I'm doing, but as I kept, I kept hearing a lot of they, and I don't know how to access this information. And so my school resource officer at that time was about to leave my school. And I said, I need you to, to think about teaching a class, but I need it to be more than, more than law enforcement. I want it to be government services, and I want you to emphasize these areas. So at the same time, I went to my social studies department and said, who in this area has the biggest connection through service learning and what we have to offer? Um, who has contacts in the system or in the local government, municipalities? And we started pulling those things into those courses. So we theorized that if my students or in the uh, government services program, and they were taking social studies classes, which they have to do, then we're going to be able to hit the details of how things work along with encompassing how the community works. It's in its infancy. It's in its third year. And we have um, a new instructor there because I went, I went to another school and stole that previous instructor to come with me. And uh, when I did that, we're doing the same thing there. Um, now the new instructor, is more in tune with what's going on in municipalities. And so I'm looking to see what's going to happen with that. And Ms. Freeman, I'm able to speak to that. <laughs> Another reason was we, we realized that we have a knack. Um, when, you're, when you ask your question, you prefaced it by the number, what, what the person would look like in the future. I happen to believe that in Dalton City, one of the... Uh, one of the benefits we have in Dalton is that we have a large Latino population. Additionally, um, if you look at our data, you'll realize that we have a large Latino population being successful in school. I thought to myself, how can we increase, how can we, um, what I envisioned was Dalton High School being the place that people came from all around the Georgia, Georgia and getting my students to come into EMS law enforcement. Um, 
even how to work in, in the political area in that community. Additionally, I wanted to make certain that the Latino voice was being heard, and uh, that's just now beginning to happen, not from this effort, but from the whole community, trying to embrace all the voters, potential voters. I, I, I'm curious, uh, how have you all inter interacted with the business community? Have they assisted you with resources, with mentoring? I mean, have you had yet, have you had success going through your chamber of commerce, for example, with these? And are they very supportive of what you're trying to do? Very much so. Um, Dalton's kind of a small community, and um, with uh, the leadership, Dalton Whitfield, Target tomorrow, all the things that are happening, and those are inf those are things coming out of the chamber of commerce. When you look at that, they always have a um, education component of those programs, and that gives us the vehicle to speak and what we do is we always bring students additionally our civic groups always want to have our students come speak to them and we found out that our best uh, commercials for our, for dalton high school was to get our students out and we've really changed what people think additionally two years ago we started all seniors having a school who are completers having a school portfolio of what they've done and they have to go through the interview process well we get all of our people to come and interview their city um, community members who own businesses are or do hiring and when those things came in they were surprised as a matter of fact 12 of our students got jobs from those particular that particular event everything from Dalton uh, utilities to Mohawk and Shaw okay. one final question other other than money what actions can the state do to help this movement <laughs> Because I know money's part of the answer already. Yes, we'll take all of your money. <laughs> <laughs> One thing the state does a really good job in the career tech area, and I don't know if you're, re I'm sure you are, they're redesigning the career technical right. area. And um, I'm excited about this. One of the good things about that is the uniqueness of each school and each municipality um, is taken into, it's taken into uh, consideration when we're developing those career tech programs. You've got to have the leeway to fine tune for your, your economic development area. Okay. And so I, I wish that we, I hope that we, my hope is we can continue for that. That's my campaign for that. Um, and I think we do need to help be held accountable. And I think with a career tech redesign, I'm looking at something really that's going to be good for the accountability part for career tech. It gives us a little bit more teeth. Additionally, I think a component is the uh, acknowledging the transient rate for the state of Georgia and um, developing a system that allows those students to move in and out of our schools and their data coming with them, uh, what they bring with them as far as academics and um, career choices and those type things. If we could, um, the Georgia College 411 starts addressing some of that, but it, I don't think it goes far enough. Okay. Well, thank you all very much. We very much appreciate it. Our next speaker will be Dr. Vincent Murray from Grady High School. I've had the pleasure of, of hearing Vincent speak before, and uh, it's just uh, the success they've had there is quite phenomenal. And uh, thank you for being with us. Well, thank you for having us here. I brought uh, with me uh, two of my teachers, and um, Ms. Young chairs the science department at Grady, and. Uh, Mr. Montero has joined us this year, and the unique thing about him is he's a graduate of Grady, and he came through our magnet program. He's returned now as our tech, technical specialist and teachers in the technical program. So we, we uh, this is an example of what career tech can, uh, how it can um, pay off. Uh, I want to start by saying this, that I'm, I'm beginning my 16th year as principal at Grady now. Uh, and uh, as I, when I reflect some of the things that I saw when I came there, uh, sort of uh, served as a model for me to see what I could do to enhance the academic program for the students at Grady High School. Of course, there were some certain things that I didn't need. To, I, I felt I really didn't need to turn my attention to, and that was with respect to the magnet program. But I did need to do something with respect to how minority students were performing academically. Um, when I came to Grady, uh, a third of our freshmen were being held back and repeated the ninth grade. Uh, the passing rate at that time, we were giving the basic skills test, not the Georgia High School graduation test, and the performance was dismally low. Um, minority students took a minimum number of courses uh, in terms of the academic core, and um, 
I can recall uh, that, and that's probably not a good thing now when I think about it, but they only had two units in science they had to do, and they took the what they needed to take, which was biology and um, physical science. Um, we did some things to turn that around where we, we reinvented the curriculum or placement of the curriculum and put uh, physics at the ninth grade, and that reduced their um, uh, perception that it was something that they could not accomplish, so they kind of had to take it. Uh, and that's where it's been ever since. So um, that served, served us well uh, with respect to uh, getting them to um, uh, be risk takers and move off to take, uh, move into rigorous elective courses. Uh, they were very apathetic about the curriculum. Uh, since that time, we've seen a tremendous change, at least I've seen a tremendous change, because they have not been there as long as I have. But um, I want to start off with the fact that um, our student population, we have, it's, it, it's about 67% African American, 27% white, and 6% uh, other. Uh, you can look and see our enrollment has really climbed over the last six years, and really right now we're not at 1216 anymore. We're at 1284. So um, that has been um, that's that's a good thing, but it's also a challenge. Um, the uh, the students are eligible to receive free and reduced price lunches for the 2005-2006 school year is about 528, and probably has climbed a little bit beyond that now. Um, we have again have um, begun to see uh, that we're ending up with a lot of students who've come from from the um, Katrina catastrophe as well as from a lot of homeless students because we're located and maybe I didn't say that but we're in the uh, in Midtown Atlanta so we're right down in the uh, area where we end up with a, a number of students who are transient students who come to our school. Our average uh, SAT scores over the last uh, five years have been, um, um, go back one. Thank you. Uh, we moved from, let's say, the school, the school year 1999 to 2000 of a score of uh, 1,002 to 1,100 last school year. Uh, this year they did a conversion and of course we were 15, we, our school was 1,500 and something and we were again the highest school in the uh, in our district. Um, the number of SAT, the number of seniors who've taken the SAT, a lot of people say that we probably um, we deselect students from taking the SAT, and we do not. We encourage them to take the SAT, but we know we have a program that we have in place that can help them to accomplish the gains that they need to make with the SAT. Next one. Um, surprisingly, I'm going to uh, take the, the liberty to say that uh, people were saying that uh, African American students could not perform on the SAT. And uh, we wanted, we broke out our data to show that what we did with respect to uh, the system and the state with respect to African American students and uh, in terms of what we did with respect to having tutorial programs available for them. And uh, we use a, um, a in-school prep program and that's made all the difference. So we're, we, 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 we're very proud of that statistic. The high schools of work assessment uh, program is been is is going to be uh, Miss Young is going to speak to that because she chairs our high schools of work uh, uh, committee. So. Well, here you see the scores. We do not have our 2006 scores up there, but our reading scores. We receive a lot of. Um, accolades for our, our st students scoring on the test. And our students do very well. And one of the things I'd like to say is that your, the high school to work test is given to 60 students out of your school and they prefer that you give it to students who are career tech students. Well, at Grady High School, we have very, very few students, sometimes 12, 13 students who are actually purely career tech. All of the students are in career, um, 
college prep courses. So our career tech students are also often dual seal. And our, we have a magnet, the communications magnet, which also qualifies them for dual seal. And it, um, our scores reflect that, and we're very proud of that. The free and reduced, oh, completion rates. Okay, the completion rates at Grady have climbed tremendously. Notice 56% to 89%, and what do we give wow. credit for that? One of the things it has been the emphasis in the ninth grade, and um, if you'll turn to the next slide, thank you. One of the things is we took, when we did our big change in the school, we focused on the ninth grade, because if you focus on the ninth grade, you can get them to the twelfth grade with success. And our ninth grade retention rate went from 35% failure to 11% failure in 2004. That's pretty amazing, and how did we do that? Well, some of the things we did, we were one of the first schools to start a summer transition program. What we did was we went to the um, the uh, middle schools that feed our school, and we worked with the teachers. We had some planning with the uh, counselors, and we identified students, and we invited them all to come to the summer transition program. We had a pretty good turnout rate. Um, we have to limit it because of the cost and the number of teachers that it takes to run the summer transition. But what had happened with that is we did math, we did a little English, but we really got them ready for high school, just getting them on the kick of you know new study habits, new commitments, things like that. It lasted two weeks the first time, I believe, this year. We had it, we went back to the summer transition and it last it um, was held for one week and during that time teachers come in and the students really get to know the school and get ready for high school and we don't we focus any student who applies is welcome to come but uh, and we get students from all ranges from the highest students to those who are at risk another one uh, big focus we had was our smaller ninth grade homerooms now that has been a really big success we went from 32 children in homerooms to 15. And I, myself, am a professional ninth grade homeroom teacher, because it's a lot easier with 15 kids than it is with 32. And what happens is teachers are advisors. And you really get to know your ninth graders. You can concentrate on their grades. I fuss at them. I make sure they have a notebook at the beginning. I keep track of them. I see them in the hall. So they really have someone who is concerned with their ninth grade and their success. And even though I stay with the ninth grade, they go on to another teacher and stay with that other teacher for 10th, 11th, and 12th. I'm able to really become an expert at advising ninth graders and um, helping them get through that first year. That really has contributed to our uh, retention rate and our completion rate. Another thing is our extensive advisement. High Schools at Work gives excellent training um, and uh, teacher preparation for teachers as advisors. And in the advisement program, we've done many different things over the time, but we have um, a calendar of events and focuses for each of the grade levels. They're grade specific, and our advisement program is uh, ninth grade specific, 10th, 11th, and 12th. Seniors concentrate on you know applying for colleges, choosing careers. 11th graders graduation test, whatever the focus is, and 9th graders have their focus. And it's a very uh, successful program. And another thing is that the courses for teachers are who teach 9th grade, teachers choose to teach 9th grade. You know, it's a punishment. You know, okay, you're new, you get the ninth graders. But, and that doesn't work. So you get people who are really committed to the ninth grader and they're a different kind of child. We all know that. And they have a lot of needs. And those people become experts. And it's a lot easier if you're concentrating on one grade level and what, what's needed for them. So those are some of our things. I just want to make a clarification because uh, in order to get teachers to um, buy into this, especially be, especially with the uh, smaller ninth grade homerooms. I asked teachers to um, well, well, I it was a global announcement to the faculty uh, that we there was a that we had a um, to establish a commitment to ninth graders because that was hurting us in terms of them not being promoted and not, and it was impacting our graduation rate. So at that 
point, we had a retreat in um, Helen, Georgia for three days at, at the close of that particular school year. And we had teachers to decide, uh, make the decision what emphasis areas they wanted to work on. And one of those emphasis areas was that department chairpersons and, and um, could, as well as other um, resource persons, could serve as a homeroom teacher. Uh, and they uh, decided that they would. So department chairpersons, uh, you don't find them serving as uh, homeroom teachers, but they, they took up on the smaller homerooms, and that's how we were able to get our classes, the, ho the homerooms uh, for ninth graders, um, 15 or less with respect to the homeroom teachers that they had. So that's really worked out well because the advisement, the advisement for ninth graders is really crucial to the success of a school. All right, we began to look at a number of other things. In other words, I think everyone knows that in education you have, it's, it's a constant, um, you have to constantly look at ways to make the school better. And we built upon the kinds of things that we've already put in place. Uh, we looked at the magnet program and we began to think that if the magnet program could be as successful as it was, then we could replicate that within smaller learning communities. Uh, four years ago, we put in place, what we did was we really surveyed our student body and uh, to find out the areas of interest that they had with respect to uh, career academies. Um, when we came, what we came away with, we had to eliminate some things that we had that were not of interest to students. For example, um, it was surprising, but I guess not in a way it was not surprising, but home economics was one of the things that they voted down. Um, but they had choices of to see what things they would be interested in. And then when we came back, we looked at what, the, what those key themes were that they uh, felt that they identified as being uh, interest areas for them. Uh, they, uh, the, the second one, Health Careers Academy, was the, the health careers was the next one that we put in place and it was based upon their interest and their, uh, and the surveys that we got back from the student body. Uh, two years ago, we had we did the same thing, and we came and the emphasis, the interest was an arts academy. So that one, is, that one was put in place two years ago. Um, this next school year, we're in our planning phase now because they have. Uh, the, the indication is that they are interested in travel and tourism. That will become our third academy that will begin in the fall of 2007. So we build our academies or our small learning communities around the interest areas of students. Uh, we, know, we know that one of, the, one of the goals of high schools of work is to provide extra help to students. And uh, what we've learned, I think, is that no student Students don't learn at the same rate. They, 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 they acquire information and knowledge at different levels and at different paces. So what we've done is we try to put, we put a program in where it says to students, we will not allow you to fail. Um, if we, we, you know, we're, we're getting to the point now where we're eliminating summer school. Uh, the summer school opportunities for students are minimal because they have to go to work, they have other things they have to do. But if there are other kinds of programs that can help them, we try to identify those kinds of things and put that in place. For example, our Let's Do It, do it Again program started actually, the application process started today. And that's for students who failed second semester courses, or part two courses last school year. They, we know that they sometimes don't master the concepts and the, um, and the material covered at the same rate. But if they're given a little bit more time, they can master the material, they can pass the class. Now the highest grade they can get in terms of taking the extra nine weeks is a C. But it is an opportunity where they master the material, are able to perform uh, well on the end of course test. And we only, we only put that program in place for end of course test classes. So that's worked very well well for us and uh, it's gotten to be very, very popular. Not to the point where they will fail on purpose to want to extend it because we don't allow that to happen with them. We let them know it's just an opportunity. If you have ha had good attendance, if your discipline has been good, and if, you, and if you, you, you've done well in the other courses that you've taken, we will consider you for the Let's Do It Again, the Let's Do It Again program. 
Uh, Ms. Young mentioned the fact that all of our teachers serve as advisors. And the thing is, is that you can't just rely on counselors. I only have four counselors in my school, and they can't get to 1,284 students. So I have to use teachers as advisors. And one thing about our school is that we empower our teachers to take on and be active participants in our, uh, with respect to our students. Yes, it's good for them to be teachers, but it's also good to be see, for students to see them in another light. And in that light, with respect to advisement, they can advise, advise them with respect to the curriculum and the things that would be beneficial in their next uh, course sequence. Uh, we have uh, Project Success, and that's for at-risk ninth graders, those students who have come to us from middle schools who have problems academically. We put them in a program where they, again, it says you will not fail. You will finish the ninth grade, and you, we will give you the support that you need in order to be able to complete the ninth grade. Uh, one of the other things, we have about 21 AP classes, and the goal is to get more students into those AP classes. And in order to offer, uh, you can't put students in a program if they're not prepared for it. So what we do is we put them in AVID, and AVID is Advancement Via Individual Determination. That's a ninth grade program that said we look at students to see if they, if they looking at their grades in middle school, looking at what they've done after the end of the first semester in high school, we look at them to see if they have the potential to go on and to put them in rigorous courses. We don't put them in AP classes until the 11th grade, but we certainly can put them in an honors course to prepare them for the fact of what AP classes will be like. So that's a way that we have um, enhanced or broadened the possibility of students taking uh, advanced placement courses. Our inclusion program is the, um, we have quite a few. We have about 104, I think, special ed, special needs students. And what we've done is we've put them all in regular classes. We don't have them in, they're not in segregated classes. They are, we put them in the, we use a model where we have a co-teacher in the class. And that teacher works with the regular teacher. And they now, since they now have to be certified in content areas, it served us very well with respect to their performance. Last year, the University of Wisconsin came down and did a study with respect to our um, special needs students in terms of their success rate. Uh, we also believe in tutorials. I think every school in the nation believes in tutorials, and we do that. We uh, couple with our Saturday school program. We have we offer SAT preparation. We do end of course test preparation, and we've established a community partnership, uh, a community based partnership with uh, one of the churches down the street. And what they've done is they've written a grant, which they got funded, and they now pick up our students who live in the community, their com in that particular community. And they uh, bring them back to um, their community-based center for tutorials during the holidays and on Saturdays. So that kind of like, uh, it's, it's a partnership where we're working hand in hand with our community-based uh, programs. Um, we also realized this. What we started seeing about four or five years ago, that there was a real problem with respect to character education. Uh, with that, we, uh, it, it was necessary for us to really look at mentoring programs and not look at them lightly, but to look at them with respect, with respect to what we had specific things that we wanted them to do with our students. Um, so we established several uh, mentoring programs. Uh, uh, the one that I, the one I'm gonna choose to talk about just one, and that's the one that I do, and that's Lunch and Learn. And that is the one that I, where I have lunch with students who are not really your voice. They're, they're, they're the silent majority of the school. They're not your leaders, your typical leaders. But they're the ones that I need to touch to find out what their thinking is, uh, what, they, what they feel is important, uh, to let them know that they have a voice. And uh, that group is the uh, group that, um, and of course, I, have, I do have the principal's mentoring group. But uh, those are the ones whom I, they are particularly my ninth graders. All right, support um, from the high schools that work reform model. One of the biggest uh, initiatives that we've gotten a lot of well, we've gotten into that has helped us the most was the High Schools at Work reform model. In 1998 or 97, 
as Dr. Murray was talking about, we went on a retreat. And what happened was High Schools at Work comes out and does a um, technical assistance visit. And they tell the truth. I mean, they look at the school and they look at it from the outside and they analyze everything. They interview children. They find out what the children think about the school. How do they really feel? How do, what do they feel about the teachers? What you're teaching and everything. And then we had a retreat. We all went up to Helen, Georgia, the uh, 22 people in the um, principal's cabinet and leadership team went up and sat down with high schools at work person and uh, she let us know exactly where we were. And it may hurt, you know, you hear things that may um, kind of sting, but it was the truth and it's nice to hear it from someone from the outside. Well, Grady had also been analyzing itself because we were thinking about becoming a charter school. We were looking, we realized that everyone wasn't succeeding. There, we had a group that was succeeding, but there were those who weren't reaching their potential. So so we thought about becoming a charter school. And in that initiative, the parents, the students, the faculty, and the community came into the school. They looked at everything from the cleanliness of the restrooms to the, the way the teachers teach and the chalkboard, I mean, just everything. We used the data from that as well as a technical assistant visit, and we completely revamped the school. And that's where a lot of the initiatives came from. And one of the most important things that high school that work gives you is to get rid of those low-level classes and um, high achievement for all students, high expectations. And yes, it takes a while to get all teachers to realize, as you were saying, uh, that everyone can succeed. It just takes work. And one of the things that High Schools at Work also has given us is um, they worked with us with the California Partnerships to develop the academies. They worked with us with curriculum revision, and they gave us a lot of staff development. And that was wonderful because we got the advisement and all the staff development we needed. But they also um, work with us in finding um, in testing, in analyzing your test data, looking at your test data and seeing exactly what's there. And high schools that work continues, continue to work with us and as we made changes and, and uh, continued with the model, we saw successes and they also um, offer the testing and the kind of analysis that we needed. Uh, High School That Work is a, the school improvement has also given us an urban initiative. We're part of an urban initiative with other schools. We get to travel, as you mentioned, uh, to schools in other places. We've been to Dallas, we've been to many school systems and seen the um, successes and the kinds of programs. And we've been open-minded and we've also adopted some ideas from other schools. And we continue to have technical assistant visits with the High School That Work reform initiative uh, that helps us. Thanks. All right, this is the, um, the, 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 the last piece, kind of. Um, the, um, where, what direction are we going now? Well, we're still continuing our trend in terms of like focusing on our ninth graders and some of the, those things will stay in place. But we've learned, you know, as I say, we look at every year we go on retreat, every year we look at what it is we can do better, what it is we need to do better. And this past school year, we had five focus groups and I can't remember all of them. I remember one was differentiated instruction. One was the fact that we had, um, we noticed that there was a difference in terms of the ninth graders, in terms of what they came in terms of prep with how they were prepared with respect to algebra one and uh, we also noticed that we had some the juniors struggled with uh, algebra two so what we did what we put in place this year is something sort of unique we have to look at it and see how it, how it plays out but what the concern was for the performance of African American males. So we have our ninth grade African American males in Algebra one class uh, together. Uh, we want to capitalize on that energy that they have and their interests to see if we can have them to focus more intently on what it is they need to do to be successful in Algebra one. We have a uh, comparable class with girls, uh, African American females, and they're in a class too that uh, centers around their interests, um, their interest and the fact that they too come with a different kind of energy that needs to be uh, captured and uh, focused uh, with respect to their academic uh, commitment and achievement. Um, with juniors, you know, we look at what we noticed was the fact that juniors. 
and especially our economically disadvantaged subgroup. They were not making the connection they needed to make to do what they needed to do on the Georgia high school graduation test. We found out what the problem was. The problem was that they did not, they could not connect from class to class from algebra one to, out to, ge to geometry, from geometry to algebra two. So it had to be a sequenced or a, it had to be a locking pattern for them. They had to learn how to do two and three step problems and they had to be able to do it over and over again until they achieved mastery. So this year we have an en enhanced uh, algebra two class for economically disadvantaged students for them to be able to make that connection between algebra one, the geometry, and then realize it in the algebra two. So those are some of the things we put in place for this school year. We have no uh, basis right now to tell whether or not it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a silver bullet. We don't think it is, but it, we think it will indeed help them to be successful as they move on through high school. So let me begin by um, thanking you very much. I, I represent the city of Atlanta. So your success is something that I like to see more of throughout the Atlanta public school system. And along those lines, I'd like to ask you a few questions. 89% um, uh, graduation rate for ninth graders is about 20% higher, if I remember my Correct. statistics, than, the, uh, than what we're seeing in APS overall. Is that right? That's yes. Correct. Yes, correct. Um, how, how is the APS doing in terms of trying to export what you've been able to, to accomplish into the other uh, high schools in the APS system? Well, I can, t I can say this. I think some of it is um, being realized. You know, like I think that uh, the majority of the high schools in APS have a second chance program or an academic recovery program like sure. Let's Do It Again. Just maybe a little bit different in terms of how it's implemented. Um, in terms of what I just announced to you, that probably has not been done yet because that's just something new that we started and we haven't really shared with anyone. All right. The, uh, the demographics of your school, I think you told me, was 67% uh, African American, 27% Caucasian, 6% other. How does that fit within the, um, the demographics of APS overall? Or do you know? I think that in terms of diversity, Grady is probably the only high school that has that kind of diverse population mm -hmm. or that kind of diversity, uh, even with any of the other um, cultural groups. Okay. How, how does it compare, for instance, to North Atlanta? Now, I'm not sure, you know, when you talk about another school, okay. I'm, 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 I'm not as familiar with them. Um, and I don't really know the um, demographics of North Atlanta. I know they, it's supposed to be comparable to Grady, but I'm not sure what that comparability is. What's the, do you know what the graduation rate is for your, um, demographically, for African American males? Yeah, I do. Mm. That's a good question. Um, and I can't give you any statistical data to tell you what yeah. that would be. I can tell you this. Okay. I can tell you when I came to Grady and, um, 15 years ago that the graduation class numbered less than 100. Yeah. And um, at that point in time, I think it's climbed. And, and, and it wasn't less than 100 due to the fact that they were, we were a small school. It was the fact that we never could realize the potential of the students who were struggling to actually uh, realize their potential and graduate them. So, I th then The reason I'm asking is I'd, I'd like to try to be able to, to go and talk to the people at APS and see how apples compare to apples so just mm -hmm. wide. Is, is that information that you could get to us or get to me? I can get it to you. Because I, I, I really would appreciate sort of the breakdown so I can, when I go talk to, to APS to see how, how they're doing. Sure. And let me say, as a graduate of Northside High School, back even when I was there, Grady was whipping us in sports, and I'm sorry <laughs> to see that you all are now whipping us in academics. <laughs> Interestingly enough, I got some interesting statistics here. If you look at Gwinnett County, their graduation rate was 74.3%, and African Americans was 71.3%. DeKalb County, the graduation rate was 50.7%. Cobb, 73.4%, and Fulton County, almost 62%. And about that number, 42% were African American, Fulton County. Thank you all very much. We appreciate it. And our, Bob, welcome. Okay. 
The next, I guess we, we should be giving prizes for the people that came the longest distance to get here. But uh, uh, at this time, we have Mr. Gary Blunt, who's the Assistant Superintendent of the Board of Education for Camden County. That's the St. Mary's area, for those of you that don't know all your counties. And We appreciate the opportunity to be here. And the first question I was going to ask is, how many of you know where Camden County is located? <laughs> okay, over half. Hopefully you'll have a better idea when we finish. To talk about what we did at Camden County High School, I have to go back in history a little and tell you where we were. We were a very small community that literally had more jobs than we had people to fill those jobs. The community had a very large paper mill, a large and active bag plant. Then in 79, the U.S. government made the decision to relocate or to locate nuclear submarine base Kings Bay there. And over the next eight to 10 years, we had 10 submarines there. We were in a situation where basically, if you could walk, talk, do anything, you could find a job. There were just jobs everywhere. Well, all of a sudden, things started changing. The economy changed. A lot of things changed. The bag plant closed. Around 750 good playing jobs gone overnight. Then the Navy started relocating submarines. Four submarines were moved to the West Coast. All of a sudden, four out of 10, so 40% of the workforce was gone. Then the big blow, the paper mill closed. 1,200 high paying jobs gone. Those jobs did not require even a high school diploma. A dropout by his senior, when his class was a senior in high school, if he dropped out his junior year, he was making $40,000 a year when his classmates were going to school. All of that went away. All of a sudden, what we were doing at the high school was not effective. Our students, our community had a very, very different set of needs. So what we set about was to totally reinvent Camden County High School. It had been the same high school for probably 35, 40 years, operated the same way. We had to start over. So we started with going to block scheduling was one of the indicators, but joining in with high schools that works and I think you're going to see a common thread between all of these schools because the thing we have in common is that we have all bought into the high schools at works principle. And we started doing things and we're going to give you a quick overview and then the people that are here with me today, Dr. John Tucker, I was principal for the last six years and now I'm at the board office, but Dr. Tucker, this is his first year as the principal. He was an assistant at the high school prior to that, so he is familiar. Ms. Roz Harold is our head of guidance. Rachel Baldwin is our Youth Apprenticeship Director, and as we go through this, you're going to see how important our CT programs are. We have one of the largest in the entire state, and it involves a lot of students. And Paul Crock is our graduation coach counselor, and he's also our fast presenter. He can get you through a lot of information in a hurry. And then once we go through that, we would like to allow you to ask questions about the specific things he talks about, because you're going to see some very, very interesting data. And one of the questions you asked about a little early, I do hope you look at the black high school graduation rate for Camden County High School for African American students and what it was and what it is now. I think you will see that that has really been a goal of ours to change that. So, Paul, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Mr. Blunt. Thank you, members. We're certainly honored to be here today to talk to you about Camden County High and these folks that I'm with today, they're the architects of this pretty amazing change that happened in South Georgia. 
As Mr. Blunt pointed out, and some of you raised your hand, we're located in South Georgia on the Atlantic coast. And when we say South Georgia, we mean as far south as you can go down I-95 without uh, being in Florida. Our school district stretches from Brunswick to the Florida line, the St. Mary's River, which defines the Georgia-Florida boundary. And most of our county is below sea level. Um, some of it's at sea level, some of it's below sea level. And as Mr. Blunt said, as recently as 2000, our school, school district was below the educational sea level also. <laughs> as a matter of fact, we were struggling to stay afloat in a lot of areas. We faced the closure of a number of local industry resources and the possible loss of millions of dollars of revenue to our school system and in personal income. And while these resources had been an important part of our economy, our students knew they could drop out of high school, find good paying jobs, and when those resources ceased to exist, students that chose not to graduate or get additional training were faced with difficult transitions and a dire economic future. In the midst of that local turmoil, our high school made the decision to reinvent itself, to take the steps necessary to become a high-achieving, high-service entity whose progress would be measured by our success in graduating our students, by our students' performance on standardized and state tests, and by our ability to create partnerships with businesses and post secondary institutions in our community that would offer our students viable, long-term employment and career opportunities. So today we want to let you know who we are in Camden County, what we've done in the past few years with regard to student achievement, and what we have done about student participation in career technical programs and where we believe our efforts will lead us in the future. We're one of the largest geographic counties in Georgia, encompassing more than 600 square miles. As you can see from this slide, our student enrollment hovers around 3,000 students annually. And you see some of this demographic information about our population, both at school and in our county. Note that we're about 30% free and reduced lunch. Our per capita annual income in Camden County is just under $17,000. Special education students are about 7% of our student body. Now part of what we want to do today is to share with you where our journey has been in recent years and to also let you know where we were and where we think we need to go. This slide and the next one will offer you some insight into what we've accomplished in terms of graduating our students. And I'd be remiss if I did not point out the substantial increases and improvements that we've made in graduation rate and reduction in dropout rate in the past four years. We're above average in this area, and we'll show how we did that and our goals to maintain that improvement in a little while. But I think if you look at this slide, you can see in six years what a substantial improvement we made. One of the more remarkable achievements that we'd like to point out about Camden County is our success in graduating students that most of the rest of the state struggles to graduate. On this slide, note the significant gains that Camden County High School has made in our graduation rates among our minority students. This past year, all of our minority subgroups graduated at a higher rate than did our white students and are also graduating at a higher percentage than the state in general. It's also important to note that we've not only graduated more students than ever before, but we've also improved their academic achievement. Based on this data, our school has met its annual yearly performance goals for the past three years. We wanted to give you some idea of how significant we feel our work in this area has been for this slide. Note that we're not showing you pass rates on Georgia tests, graduation tests. We're pointing out failure rates and comparing them to the performance of the state of Georgia in these four key indicators of academic achievement. I want to point out the trend over time and also that we're substantially lower in every area than the state, including that dreaded science graduation test. Another area where we believe that significant improvement has been achieved is in the types of graduates that we're producing. Given the nature of our community and the resources available to it, we've made purposeful effort to help our students develop as many educational resources as possible while they're in high school. 
To this end, note the large number of students at Camden County that graduate with both a college preparatory diploma and also a career technical diploma or dual seal diploma. Also, we think it's important to note that while that's happening, many of our graduates carry the technical degree, a technical career technical diploma, which is indicative of the career trends and economic trends in our region and in Georgia also. This chart right here captures what I think is the depth and the breadth of our career technical programs and gives you some idea of the training and preparation offered to Camden County High School students interested in technical and career programs. First of all, just note the large number of programs and also the number of in, uh, new programs implemented in, uh, in the last few years, and they're noted in yellow on the chart. When you combine this, with the extensive accompanying breadth and depth of our academic programs at Camden County High School, it is impressive. Note the expansive offerings that we've added in science. Now what is not on this chart are the additional courses that we're offering now in advanced placement in every academic area and the extensive courses we offer our highly talented students in music, drama, and fine arts, including AP courses in music theory and art, as well as a theater technology course that's available as a fine arts or career technology course. So as you can see, we're rising above sea level at this point. We're <laughs> racing uphill, as it were, at least academically. And the question, of course, is how do we start the journey? What have we done to make it possible? And where do we need to go to continue? And as Mr. Blunt pointed out, our administration and faculty looked for guidance and at what were proven steps to base this change on, looked at the research and the data. And we found a model in the High Schools That Work program that as a school improvement process that we saw, heard, and read about, and we felt like this was the place to begin. And our faculty, by an overwhelming vote, embraced the principles, practices, and standards of this improvement plan. And one by one, we began to make changes in our overall educational philosophy into the way our school operated. What were some of the critical steps to success? First, like many of the other schools that you've heard from today, we increased the rigor in our curriculum. We required all of our ninth and 10th graders to take college prep courses. We added additional math and science course requirements for graduation for all students so that all of our graduates now have to take four math and four science as well as four language arts and four social studies courses to graduate regardless of their diploma type. We also created more advanced placement classes across the academic spectrum in order to challenge and better prepare our college preparatory students. We also created additional opportunities for student success. We offered students additional uh, completion time and an opportunity to demonstrate content mastery through a course extension program. And we created special before and after school as well as weekend tutorial programs for students that needed additional academic support in their current courses. And we also implemented and expanded a large scale credit recovery or redemption program that allows students to make up failed courses using online learning software as well as teacher supervised assessment and direct instruction. We also made accompanying significant physical changes to our facilities. We established a ninth grade center that separated our freshmen physically and academically from our main high school building. And using special grant funding, we designated the ninth grade center as a small learning community with features such as expanding technology for student and teachers to use in their instruction, combined planning time by academic discipline, and the addition of staff that specifically addressed problems and issues typically encountered by freshmen. This person was called a dropout prevention lead teacher. We also enhanced our career technical programs and facilities, adding programs and areas of study that fit our community's changing economic needs and added a fine arts auditorium and fine arts classroom space to develop a first class fine and performing arts program, adding additional staff and programs as in student enrollment grew substantially in the past half decade to include the previously mentioned theater technology program and this year a new orchestral strings program that's been started in our elementary grades. We've also expanded our collaboration with our community partners. 
Our relationship with Coastal Georgia Community College Camden Center, which now includes student access to dual enrollment for career technical programs and offers students simultaneous college and high school credit via the Axel coursework, as well as continued refinement of articulation agreements that allow our students to earn college credit in specific career technical courses taught in our classrooms. And we established numerous business partnerships that offer our students opportunities to enroll and participate in work-based learning situations and developed opportunities for students to get career training and develop high-level skills during youth apprenticeship served at the Trident Refit Facility and other businesses at the, on the Kings Bay Submarine Base. Through this process, our faculty and staff also made important adjustments and additions to their skills and practices, specifically through professional development and adaptation. They embraced learning-focused strategies, which is a solid research-based method to improve instruction. Mr. Blunt mentioned that we went on block scheduling, and that required us to change the way teachers taught. And each year, we ensure that every faculty member is trained and evaluated based on this model of educational practice. And we make it a focal point of our ongoing professional development activities. We also implemented the High Schools That Work program focus teams so that we basically established and we impact school governance at a grassroots level with teachers and staff serving on those focus teams. We focus on specific areas of school operation and practice, including curriculum development, professional learning, and ongoing program assessment. We adopted the whole faculty study group process, which allows educators to meet, to talk about what works, to analyze student work, to evaluate their te teaching methods, and to share those in a professional, collegial collaboration and development method. Also, we implemented and expanded our Teachers as Advisors program. This is another key element that you've seen with, a couple, with both the other schools today. Our Teachers as Advisors program allows students to have an advisor pretty much stay with them through their whole high school career. They meet weekly, they discuss educational and career planning issues. Uh, the curriculum is driven by students' grade level and also their needs. And annually, their course counseling and registration process is done by students and their parents with this advisor. Beginning this year, every staff member at our high school including counselors, administrators, every staff member is a part of the advisory team, not just teachers, in order to reduce the total number of students that each staff person is advising. Also this year, we've marketed that program a little differently. We call it PAWS now. You know, we are the Wildcats. And so we now have PAWS advisory every week. That's planning for academic and work success. And today, we're fairly confident that if you go in our school, every student you ask, will know the name of their PAWS advisor. And as a part of that process, selected grade level students are given additional training on key resources needed for post-secondary planning and access to financial aid, starting with our seniors. Also, we have added a great deal of work in professional learning and staff development. We have created and fostered at the system and school level uh, a program we call the Professional Enhancement, Enhancement Conference, and all teachers in our system participate in that conference for two days in February. And that conference is organized and developed locally, and our high schools created many sessions utilizing state, national, and local providers to improve our goals and, our, and help support our initiatives. Also, we send our student and teacher members, not students, but teacher members to the high schools that work national conference every year to make sure that we have ongoing training in those areas. So what lies ahead for us? Well, we have to improve our student attendance. We think that that's one of the initiatives that will help us, and we've made great strides this year in doing so, adding both positive incentives and enforcement of rules designed to make sure students are at school. We're also exploring the need of additional small learning communities. We're looking at things like perhaps a fine arts academy or a math and science academy, or perhaps a career technical academy aimed at offering upper class students expanded apprenticeships and more real world work opportunities. Also, we know we have got to continue our emphasis on graduation test preparation and passage. We've created Saturday and after school tutorial programs. We're also using more technology and online learning resources to offer additional focused mastery opportunities to those students. 
And also, we are going to continue to grow our career and technical programs and our work-based learning opportunities. We're working with the college to redefine our articulation agreements and also to work with the workforce development program in our community to make sure that our programs meet the needs of our community for the future. And also, through our advisement program, we know that we have to offer more guidance to students about post-secondary opportunities, programs that uh, help them get further education and training. So we've offered you a perspective on the hard work and satisfaction that we at Camden County take in our achievement. We think that perhaps one day we'll no longer be at sea level, but perhaps we'll be at the top or at least on the side of the mountain, as this picture shows. But in fact, we want to really say that through rigor, relevance, and relationships at Camden County High School, we know that there are valleys and hills we encounter, but the knowledge that our students are making progress, that our school is not under the surface of the academic sea, we're willing to try new things, embrace new practices, and share with others what we know works and what's good for our students. Thank you for letting us be here today. Sure. And I know that some of these folks out here are dying to answer your questions, and they're much more qualified than I. Bob. I really enjoyed the uh, presentation because I guess one of the things that all of us have to deal with when we're making improvements and changes to that is the cost. And I know that the school deals with the high school yeah. 3000 on this morning. What kind of uh, yes, aggregate increases were involved in your instituting new programs? That I'm going to let these people enhanced, talk about uh, budget because they're better okay. money than I am. And I was just wondering approximately what percentage total increase did you experience during the, say, five-year period? You have some of these that are one over five years. That's because, you know, if we were to adapt and make recommendations in the form of legislation about things like this, I think we have to have some kind of ballpark idea of what kinds of financial needs are, are necessary to bring these positive changes about. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, for presentation, I uh, didn't get a chance to ask Grady High School a uh, question, but uh, it's basically along the same line. Wonderful presentation to you. Commend you on for the job that you're doing. Um, the career technical programs that you highlighted that have been added uh, this past year, what's the determining factor to uh, let you know what programs are to be added? I know Great has stated that they had a survey. Uh, are you relying solely upon that survey? Are you getting feedback from the community, the business community as well, to make that determination as to what technical program you're going to add to that curriculum? The job market okay. is the number one indicator. Because I, I'm from Gwinnett County, and, and, and I've been uh, talking this career path up out there, and, and they're very excited that we're holding these meetings. They're looking forward to the state moving in that direction, even much more on a larger scale. Uh, but the one question that they're having out there is, how do you get the parents to buy into this concept when that parent in mind is solely sold that little Susie is going to Georgia Tech and University of Georgia? not in that correct uh, career technical field, so we have to do 
uh, sensitive education training for the parents as well. Uh, the other point uh, that I want to bring out, and a question I have too that struck my interest was the Saturday afternoon tutorial session. Okay, the tutors that you have uh, in these sessions, are they from the schools, the business communities, or how long are the tutorial sessions? And that's Saturday afternoon. And they're usually Saturday mornings. Saturday mornings, I'm sorry. And they, they, uh, they are teachers. Uh, we use a combination of uh, online learning software, and we also use, use some direct instruction. They usually last between an hour and a half to three hours, depending on which program it is. Okay. All right, thank you. I guess just an observation, and, and, and sitting here and listening to three different presentations from three parts of the state, um, it, it appears that uh, you all have been successful, and, and ninth grade seems to be the time to, to do this. All right, is that a consensus on that, probably? It, all right. Okay. All right. And, uh, you know, it, it's also, I believe everybody who's in high schools at work, um, and this is sort of a sad commentary on the legislature, that I've been a member of this committee for eight years, um, and I didn't know about high schools at work until last year when I went to an SREB meeting. And I would venture to say, uh, that 90 percent of the people in the legislature are not familiar with this. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you all have found different ways to be very successful. We certainly commend you, and you give us a lot of food for thought. The good news is whatever legislation we do, we will not try to do one size fits all. You obviously all uh, are good examples of why uh, we should leave initiative at the local level. And uh, probably a good thing we're only in session for 40 days. Uh, but nevertheless, I, I do think uh, you, you're some w wonderful models to emulate. And uh, I know on our first meeting we had and now this meeting that for those of us that are not professional educators, which by the way, about 80% of the committee is probably involved in education at least in one way, shape or form. It's certainly been an eye-opening experience I think for all of us. Our last speaker is speaking of legislatures is Bob Couch from the state of South Carolina. He's the state director of career technical education. And uh, I first met Dr. Murray and Bob uh, in Asheville about six weeks ago, I guess it was at this point in time. And South Carolina is the first state that I'm aware of in the southeast to actually uh, do legislation dealing with vocational ed and getting these skills down at the high school level. And uh, Bob was involved in the, putting the legislation together and implementing the legislation, and now he's stuck with making sure it really works. And uh, unlike those of us sitting up front here that pass bills, uh, people out there do have to do the work as a result of these bills. So Bob, if you will. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, committee members. Uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, present. Uh, Georgia has done a great job. I know that uh, we've learned a lot from Georgia. In fact, we have a model down in uh, near Myrtle Beach from the CEC uh, school down in Noonan, Georgia. In fact, uh, I've sent a number of people down to take a look at that uh, site, and I brought two busloads myself down to, to take a look. Uh, what I'm going to share with you is a state level perspective and certainly in no way do we have all the answers. We have some of the answers but not all the answers. Uh, we heard certainly have seen today three very good models at Dalton and Grady and Camden, uh, three different types I think of institutions. Uh, but the real core that leads through all of those institutions as the chairman uh, mentioned is high schools at work. I never have met a, when you talk about the expectations, uh, Mr. Chairman, earlier uh, uh, relative to what people expect, and I think uh, some of the speakers addressed that today. I've never met a teacher or anyone else who did not believe their child could learn at a higher level. I remember in a discussion one time with uh, teachers, I was interviewing all the teachers and basically had a set of questions, 
And one of the questions was, do you believe that all students can learn at a higher level with higher expectations and achieve more? And I had one teacher that said, well, I really don't believe so. And I knew she had children. I said, well, do you believe your children can learn at higher levels and raise expectations? She said, sure. I said, then every child should have that same belief that you should believe that everybody in your classroom can do the same thing. Jim Collins in his book, Good to Great, takes 12 companies in which he looks at what created the change relative to performance. And you're seeing some of that change now where uh, pharmacists and drugstores are building across from each other. If you look at his book, he talks about the real change that occurs is that you have to change the people who are on the bus. Because the fact is that we found in 1960 that sometimes people have, have to give up the front seat when they don't want to change. And a part of educational change is that everybody's not going to buy into it. I'm not sure, and I think the chairman would probably say too, in the legislature, in dealing with the legislature in South Carolina, you know, we would hope that all would want to change, but that's not always the case. You have state agencies that have silos that they want to maintain. You, that they do not want to change. They don't want to give up the control. So part of developing legislation is to build a bridge, a partnership, to enable that to happen. We began in really five or six years ago uh, developing a plan and partnership where the legislature was deeply involved, very similar you have here. You do have to have uh, House and Senate leadership. You have to have legislators like the chairman and others here who truly believe that there's something that needs to be done differently than what you're doing. Assuming that leadership getting buy-in from agencies as well. When we formed the state level partnership committee, that included, in fact, I've worked for now uh, four different governors and serving staff to their various state level committees, both Republican and Democrat. A part of the forming of that partnership committee at state level helped create and bridge the change. It included the CEO of the state chamber, the Department of Commerce, the Department of Labor, the Commission on Higher Education, the State Technical College System, State Superintendent of Education, and other state level individuals with a great cadre of educators and business people in a support role. And a part of that whole partnership effort was chair chaired by a legislator. And a part of that whole partnership plan was to create what you're going through the process here with this particular committee is looking at best practices where the gaps are and then begin to look at what kind of legislation needs to be developed in order for that to occur. There are two documents that I brought today. One's called Pathways to Prosperity, and the second one, Steps to Prosperity, which is up here on the front area, is the last book that Steps to Prosperity set forth the legislation we passed and signed into law by Governor Sanford in 2005. But laying out that legislation again was a part of input from across the state uh, regional meetings held to make sure that we did get uh, uh, full input. So behind you have to do your homework as being done here to really figure out what really needs to be done. The others being able to get buy-in to the fact that uh, what is the problem that, you're, that we're facing? We had to look at that in our state. The, the chairman mentioned earlier was the fact that the dropout rate has got to be dealt with in all states. If you look at our completion rate, it's about 67 percent. Completion rate is different than a dropout rate. Politics get involved and, and, and began to surface and, and dwell in on the dropout rate and people use it for their own gain. The issue is that every child in every state ought to be looked upon in a way that every educator and every business leader and every legislator believes that child can graduate high school and be successful. You have to believe that every child can make it, every child can be successful. You see me up here this afternoon. You never believe that I grew up in a house with no running water, no inside toilet, only a pot belly stove that heated the house. My parents dropped out in the seventh grade. Uh, I could go on and on about my life. But the fact is, you never know who's sitting in your class. And to believe that people cannot make it. My parents always said that you never use poverty or circumstance as a reason to not succeed. My parents went back, got their high school diploma. My father basically taught himself to read. They went on to college. He went on to seminary and graduated. My mother started writing books at age 70. 
So it's a matter of fact that you have to believe that every person can succeed because that's the only way we can change society and change the dropout rate. So part of the process is identifying the problem. The dropout rate is one. The other one is, is how about economic development? All of us deal with, in our states, where is the current economy and what kind of jobs are available with the majority of the jobs in your state and our state are in small business. Supplying a workforce to support their growth, but also supplying a workforce that enables the future technology-driven companies to move into Georgia and South Carolina as a part of the growth process to improve per capita income. I just completed a study, there's a copy up here. I looked at three areas, uh, healthcare, childcare, and, and travel and tourism. It was for a grant that uh, the Department of Commerce uh, has, has submitted and the governor's office has submitted to federal level for funding. Well, I looked at our state and I compared Georgia and North Carolina in those three areas. And that study is here and I think you'll find it interesting as to how parallel that South Carolina, North Carolina, and Georgia are in those three areas. Our state about $14 billion in, in tourism, travel and tourism, but most people in our state don't realize that an export-import business in our state is about $46 billion. And yet, when you look at the impact of business and the economy, that's an issue that you need to look at in terms of, of a state level, in terms of what are the challenges. The other one is being able to move from secondary to post-secondary without remediation. It's to be able to have a seamless connection between secondary and post-secondary, be able for students to be able to move between higher education, one institution, the other without losing credit, to be able for these barriers to be eliminated in regards to student transition in a seamless PK through 20 system. And so that, that is an issue. And so when you look at the, the reasons for our legislation, there's a dropout rate, the seamless pathway needed to be become more seamless, there needed to be people at the table and agencies at the table to create the articulation and dual enrollment opportunities, removing barriers, the belief that all students can learn and learn at higher levels, and increasing, as we heard this afternoon, the rigor of academics across all the curriculum. Another part of the change that took place in 1998 when I came back to the department is we have redesigned and redeveloped the career and technical education in our state. Uh, our legislation, I'm going to go into that uh, and do a quick summary of that. But before I begin, there's an article in the Atlanta Journal today that I picked up. And it's interesting the fact that uh, in that article it talks about immigrants from Mexico and India now make up the largest number of immigrants in our country. 34 million U.S. residents born somewhere else. In 1915, 13% had a high school diploma. In 2006, ages 24 and higher have a high school diploma, 85%. Who owned homes? 1915, 46%, 2006, 69%. Life expectancy, 54 years in 1915, 2005, 78. Over 65 years of age, 4 million in 1915, 37 million in 2006. So the fact is that the change of who lives and where we are today and who makes up our almost 300 million residents of this country also dictate where we're headed in education and where we're headed in the future as far as the economy. We have looked at uh, basically the challenge, and I'm going to go through these hurriedly, and I will show you at the end where you can actually access this uh, PowerPoint presentation. We looked at the unskilled labor challenge, and I'm going to show you a slide here just in a minute. If you've not heard about uh, Friedman's book or either read it, uh, I'm sure that uh, this will at least spark your, your memory to some extent. When it talks about here that they're starving for your jobs in China and India, we're thinking about over there. Let me say now, based on my research, it's not about over there we got to worry about, it's about here. So a part of the transition of a world economy is that people are mobile. In, this, in China right now, less than 1% of their educational system and their population has a technical education focus. Right now, they're scrambling. I got a call recently, want me to come to China 
because they want to establish a set secondary career and technical program because they want to be more competitive in the world. 500,000 PhDs are sitting around in master's degree level people in what we call unemployed state in China. They have, do not have the technical workforce uh, to do what they want to do to be able to capture a greater uh, part of the, of the uh, world economy. What's the last thing you picked up that was not made in China? I don't care what it is, that's where it's made. When you look at this in terms of the challenge, our challenge was, and, and again, there's probably 10 different dropout rates that are used by different groups. All we know is it was a challenge that we had to face. This is another challenge we looked at in terms of where the jobs are, where education is needed. What we found is that 40% at the bottom of this pile here, in terms of statistics, are not prepared to go into the workforce and be successful. When you look at two-year degree compared to four-year degree, Michigan State University did a study, has done numerous studies over the years. Two years ago, the gap closed completely on two-year associate degree technical graduates versus four-year graduates of starting pay. Both started at about $36,000 a year. Now, that has changed dramatically. Here are some samples of two-year and four-year fields. What we've debated in, in our legislation, what we dealt with is looking at what are the pathways to success. Looking at where students exit the system, be able to be successful, make choices and options. And in our legislation, labeling of students has been eliminated. Meaning that every student is headed toward a career pathway. It requires rigorous academics. Uh, the technical aspect of support curriculum is a part of that system as well. And so students are looked upon in terms of where, it, where are they headed? What is their career cluster, or career pathway? What are their interests? What do they plan to focus on in terms of a study while they're in high school that will prepare them for college? Uh, traditionally, we've had a two-path system in South Carolina. And a part of that has been that we've now moved toward a college prep pathway system. Uh, and again, looking at how and where the jobs are. Our legislation calls for basically five or six important things. Number one is that the PK-12, PK-16 system is seamless, that every student will have career assessment beginning in middle school by the seventh grade. There will be an individual graduation plan that's flexible developed in the eighth grade. Our legislation calls that the parent and the student and the counselor sit down together in middle school. The legislature last year funded uh, 250 career specialists to reduce the guidance personnel ratio to 301 in middle schools. We will this year request additional funding, the legislature that will now put additional 270 in high school so that the middle school and high school guidance personnel ratio from, to, from three, to 301 across uh, all school districts in South Carolina. They will work with under the direction of a guidance counselor as a part of that process in developing career pathway plans. The students will elect a career major focus of study by the end of the 10th grade and the 11th and 12th grade. And every school district will be required next year to have a program in place that is evidence-based to deal with the dropout rate. We have model programs currently being developed. We have two evidence-based research uh, dropout prevention programs now uh, that were um, piloted last year. We'll be piloted again next year. We have the Clemson University Dropout Prevention Center involved. We've done a matrix and identified all of the programs that have evidence-based research that they in fact do work in uh, retaining uh, students in school. But the major goal, as you saw today in these other um, high schools is that there's an important part uh, that, that's played in relationships to make sure that students do not drop out. By the way, two years ago when uh, Gates and Bill Daggett and Gene Bottoms looked at 300 schools in high school for national recognition, there were 30 that were selected. We had three of those high schools out of the 30. All 30 high schools had a career pathway system that were recognized as being the top high schools in the country. There was a study that was conducted, uh, you may have seen this study, the University of Minnesota looked at 
11,000 students in 1992 relative to how the career pathway system changed course taking, attendance, uh, high school completion, ongoing to post-secondary institutions, all the things you would expect to change in fact did change. What we found in research that students in fact do have three, at least three technical courses in their high school are less likely to drop out. If they take four, they almost never drop out. So the fact is that you connect relevance, rigor, and relationships to a curriculum, then you will find the transfer of that to keep students in school. The other part of our legislation is clar clarifying the articulation and dual enrollment piece. Uh, again, going back to the fact of change, a year ago, never in the history of education in South Carolina was there truly a committee set up to where secondary four-year colleges and universities and two-year colleges were around the same table together. And in fact, I made that statement when we had 40 people around the table, this is a landmark day because this has never happened. But by the way, it started with a meeting held by Gene Bottoms two years ago in which we invited all the higher educational leadership to the table with secondary leadership. And Gene came over and developed and, and presented uh, to that group with a very specific plan for integration and, and partnership planning. And that was a part of precursor that I got him involved in that prior to development of the educational uh, legislation that we passed. The other is that uh, tomorrow I'll be in front of the State Board of Education supporting two pieces of, of regulations that are going through. In that regulation, first of all, seat time will be eliminated as, as, the, as the process of recognition of credit. To give you how some people, Mr. Chairman, do not like to change, I remember a year and a half ago we had a debate, I was in a room, and sometimes you have to stand up and be the only one for change. And I had a person who was well thought of, and, and I thought a lot of him as well, who argued with me to try to figure out a way to maintain seat time on virtual courses. So you try to figure that one out. Uh, so the process now is that when you look at elimination of seats, secondly, current technical courses now, I've been able to negotiate in regulations, get that door open to where they will be recognized for honors credit, uh, going through the appropriate process. Tomorrow, it has gone through the second reading and approved by the state board, but we're gonna have people to show up to board tomorrow to argue, to undo this one. At the last board meeting, it was voted on by the state board that any dual enrollment course will carry the same weighted credit as an AP or IB course. So that shakes up educators more so than it does. And it'll check, it'll check up some parents. But if you've got a university course, we've got courses right now, and, and one of the institutions mentioned earlier about the engineering course. We've got engineering courses right now that are recognized by all of the universities in our state for dual credit and recognition of credit in their freshman engineering course work. And what I'm saying is if it's recognized at the University of South Carolina, Clemson University, RIT, Citadel, South Carolina State University, and 27 other universities in the country, wouldn't you think it ought to carry the same kind of weight as these other courses? Because it's the end of course university tests that are given as a part of that process. So again, we will, we will have that tomorrow. And again, all of this is moving forward to support the legislation. Another part of this is we will have regional centers. There will be 12 regional centers that will coordinate and work with. And there will be a coordinator of these regional centers to work with schools, school districts, and colleges as a part of a coordinated effort to roll out the legislation. There's a state level council. In fact, they met today. I serve as staff to that council. The chair was appointed by the governor. Twelve members of that particular council were appointed by the governor and the, the Senate and House leadership. And then the state superintendent of education had appointments uh, as well, including business leaders and legislators that serve on that particular coordinating council. They oversee the implementation of the Education Economic Development Act. Um, the personal pathway system is basically one that's built around the 16 clusters. The legislation also calls that every 
district will have at least three clusters as a part of that. Some of the ways that we're dealing with that now to offer more in rural areas is that we will move to a virtual school delivery system. We've just completed 34 in, in the business administration uh, cluster. We've just completed the beta test on 34 end of course assessments for that particular cluster. Our goal is in early next year to have all 34 courses into virtual schools. We will also put into virtual schools in January keyboarding and computer applications because we require computer literacy as evidenced by an end of course assessment um, in order to graduate high school. What we found are that IT teachers are now teaching computer um, keyboarding and computer apps rather than the advanced courses. So now then we're going to move to a system whereby those are delivered online. These are the 16 clusters. We have nine booklets developed. We will develop the other seven this year. This is basically the step process that we've used in the legislation that begins uh, Uh, what we call refer to steps of success beginning in uh, K through 5. And part of that process is moving on to uh, the, the process to go into post-secondary education. All of our career and technical programs either are moving to have already achieved national certification. All of our teachers are required to come on board have to, within five years to receive national certification in their field. We will link up next year to where we will have 3,500 certifications available online. Uh, we are seeking uh, funding, a million dollars funding to support that, to pay for that uh, certification of teachers as well as students. We are also requesting next year $10 million that every student takes a dual enrollment course. The tuition will be paid to that college or university. Uh, we had 9,000 students last year to get dual enrollment credit. We will now move next year hopefully to a have a greater success with that in terms of, of dual enrollment. Uh, the, the colleges have agreed on a $500 fee for tuition and book or books uh, from, uh, for a student earned credit to be paid for a three-hour course. Uh, again, looking at uh, the K-8, we looked at that today with some of the sites. And again, the individual graduation plan, to give you some idea how that's going to work in the legislation, is that we are piloting right now the electronic individual graduation plan. Uh, becoming January, it will be rolled out across the state. There is a state level career man or, uh, management system called the academic and career management system referred to as Palmetto Pathways Management System. That system, every student will complete an IGP. There will be a portfolio attached to that. There will be data pre-populated. For example, we are in agreement now, close to an agreement with ACT, American College Testing, where they will pre-populate the data, explain, uh, a plan and explore as well, as well as offering work keys online with pre and post assessment uh, to all secondary students. Uh, students that complete that will have the opportunity also to, to earn a career uh, assessment a certification that's labeled uh, gold, silver, and bronze that meets the standards that business expects. There will be a remediation from the pre to post on work keys so that students will be able to close that achievement gap and be able to move to that level uh, that's expected uh, both by uh, within the educational arena as well as um, business and industry. This is a very uh, weak look at an IGP. The, it's much more sophisticated in, in terms of how we've developed it. But basically what happens in our IGP system <coughs> is that beginning in the fall of next year, if you have a computer, wherever you have a computer, you'll have access to, to the parent and student will have access to the IGP. They'll read only but, and then because the legislation requires that every year a parent and the student will sit down with a counselor or a career specialist under the counselor's guidance to have a conference about their individual graduation plan. It is flexible and continues to move through that system. That is one reason that, we have, that we've added additional support for the guidance personnel staff. 
Uh, the other is we've taken away the administrative duties of counselors as a part of that process. And they've been identified in the guidelines as to what those duties are that have been eliminated as a part of that process. Um, the continuation of guidance will occur. Uh, that would be expected in any program in the guidance model. Uh, There's certain aspects that have to be maintained. Again, looking at career preparation, uh, we are in uh, significant partnership with post-secondary, two-year and four-year. Um, we believe that um, we are where we need to be in order to, 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 to really launch this forward. I would say, Mr. Chairman, one of the challenges we have, and I'm not sure that, and I think you, you mentioned to it earlier, is the local uh, level, is that all the legislation calls for a statewide agreement. I think we can get basically an agreement in concept, but again, dealing with all the, all the individual institutions. We have been able, at the four-year college university, at the Commission on Higher Education level, this committee to eliminate the electives. Uh, for college admission. The only one that was left in there is fine arts. And what I negotiated with them is to recognize any major or either eliminate the electives. Because I asked them, you know, what does it have any impact on college admission? The answer to that is no. It's been there for a long time, so there's been agreement to eliminate those. Uh, so that's, that's a step forward, at least in that area. We have 85 courses that are recognized at two-year institutions that we hope will now be recognized from secondary, at least to have that, that opportunity for dual enrollment and articulation. Again, that sort of uh, summarizes what I've just mentioned relative to uh, the process. One of the things that I do believe, and I found this to be true over the years, is basically when you have a change occurring, Typically, 60 to 65 percent, 60 percent maybe will buy into it fairly readily. You have another 20 percent with more information they'll buy in. You have 20 percent, some will never buy in, uh, and some with more and a lot more information may buy in. Um, I do believe that change should occur in a, way, in, a, in a way in which it creates a positive synergy to change. But as I found in my office, and as I'm sure you found in your school settings, people that do not want to change either will move on their own or either you have to find a way to move them. Because you can find three or four people that will block the change that will occur. Part of that process uh, is also as you move legislation forward. These numbers here are, are older. We have 166 high schools at work site. The legislation calls for high schools at work reform model or another whole school reform model that a district may elect, which goes back to the local control. So we will have 120 high schools. The remainder of those schools are middle schools. We have 258 high schools, or, or 208 high schools in, in our state. We, as a SREB state, uh, last year we have the highest number. We have 95% of career and technical students taking the highest level math. So our state leads all SREB states in course taking of math, higher level math, among the SREB states. Two years ago, our state led all of the high schools at work state in math, science, and reading performance. We have, if you're talking about TA vi visits, we have 35 this year. That involves about 600 uh, people that we have to line up for that uh, opportunity. We do get high schools at work funding. We got 2.1 million last year uh, to support that effort. Uh, this is an example of how a high school came, became a high school at work site. In 1987 was the first high school at work site in our state. They developed the career pathway system. 97% of their students select a career major. At graduation, they receive a gold cord and their major is announced. And so whoever is graduating actually is announced, Bob Couch graduating with a major in engineering or health science or whatever the area may be. We have reformed curriculum in many ways in the technical side. About 35% of our enrollment is four-year college bound uh, students. Career and technical students in our state have the highest graduation rate compared to non-career and technical students. Uh, we, uh, 
we look at those, those students in our programs that who are at risk, that are identified as special students or special ed students, graduate at a higher rate as well. Uh, so when you look at the performance occurring technical in our state, part of that was in 1998 when I came back to the department, when I set out on a course to reform it. That included establishing, and we've grown now from no sites in 1998 to 114 project lead away sites across our state. Almost 10,000 students are, in, are enrolled in engineering programs. That includes both middle and high school. We have 37 Oracle Academies. Uh, we, I'll be negotiating tomorrow with Oracle to bring the, the mid-Atlantic training of, of Oracle teachers to the University of South Carolina. Uh, we have now a robotics regional competition, brought business people together as a part of that. We raised $250,000 a year from the business community. Bell South has been a leader in that effort. We started VEX competition last year with 35 teams. We have 28 robotic teams in our state. We have 300 LEGO teams. We had 5,000 students and parents attend last year in middle school competition for two days at the University of South Carolina who coordinates robotics as well as the LEGO League competition. We have 30 engineering programs at elementary schools. We're in discussion with one of the districts now to set up an engineering academy for elementary schools that will feed through middle school engineering academy to a high school that will now feed into the ICAR project connected with Clemson and BMW uh, in Greenville. Uh, so those particular programs. We have 60 Cisco networking sites. We have 47 virtual enterprise sites in our state, all high tech requiring greater math uh, skills. Uh, what we found uh, in looking at what the problems were and what they were to be solved and what would happen is it would create a greater vibrant economy, is that economic growth would occur, is that there would be a greater completion rate and remediation would be reduced at post-secondary. There would be an alignment between secondary and post-secondary curriculum. Uh, there would be also students that would stay in school uh, that the dropout rate would be reduced, completion rate would increase as a part of that process. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think we have moved to the point, as we heard today with your committee uh, reports, is I think there's a wave shaping up over the country that it's not going to be us versus them, technical versus others. This whole integration approach of academic and technical cannot be separated. It all is integrated and together. So it's a matter of what a person's interest is and what they choose to study in the future would be looked upon with equal respect. In my family, we've got musicians, songwriters, ministers, doctors, lawyers. My brother was an automotive technician who owned his business, made more money than anybody else in the family through the lawyers and the doctors. <laughs> the question was, did I love him less than I love my brother who is a lawyer? The answer to that is no. It's not about what you do that gains the, the, the respect, it's about who you are. Who you are should create the respect that one has for each other as part of that process. As we heard about Grady here today, every student, whether it's in South Carolina or Georgia, whether they're in the inner city of Atlanta, or they're among the 51% free reduced schools and students in our state, they should have the same opportunity of success as the suburban schools in Atlanta, suburban schools in South Carolina. There should be an opportunity for all. Our legislation is designed in a way that creates respect and opportunity for all students. There was a question asked earlier about how do you get parents to buy into the career pathway system. What we have found in Lexington 1 in, in, in Columbia was designated as the pilot site. It's an urban, it has urban, suburban, and rural schools. When parents were, were brought in into forums within that school district, that was not just a casual buy-in to the career pathway system. There was a major buy-in to the point of parents saying, why didn't we have this when I was coming along? This is what works. We did have an issue. Uh, the chairman asked that I talk about the good and the bad. The challenge we did have came to the Black Caucus, which was rightly so, when we started looking at the, the dropout rate. 
is in the legislation, the only part of the legislation that calls for separate regulations is in the area that deals with dropout prevention. Because the Black Caucus did not want a disproportionate number of African Americans